from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Um, he is here to talk about his new, new book about the, I believe it is 10 presidential and vice presidential debates of which he has been the um, host and which he has handled with a, a, an, an aplomb that has impressed everybody in, in the nation, particularly his fellow journalists and those in the political community. Jim is also a man of serious literary interests and accomplishments. It says something about Jim that the place where he and I first met a quarter of a century ago was in the house of the, the distinguished novelist Ann Tyler. Um, Jim is at least as well connected in the world of literature as he is in the world of journalism and his long presence on the what was originally the McNeil Lehrer News Hour on PBS uh, has been one of the, the bright the brightest lights of broadcast journalism. Jim? Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. I am uh, I am delighted to be here, and I join Jonathan, my friend Jonathan Yardley, in welcoming you uh, with great pleasure to the National Book Festival. I've been do I've done this before. It is an incredible event. As you have, if you haven't been here before, you're in for a real treat. And I am very honored that you would begin your morning uh, with a threat of rain uh, to come here to uh, to this particular tent at this particular time. Uh, I have an escort representing the Library of Congress and, and the book festival, Jerry Greenwood, and he asked me just now if I plan to do a bus call uh, this morning, and uh, I explained to him that this book, uh, my new book, is nonfiction, and it is about my experiences and other people's experiences with presidential debates. And uh, bus call, let me explain the bus call thing. Uh, Back in the 1950s, I worked as a ticket agent in the Trailways Bus Depot in a place called Victoria. Anybody know about Victoria, Texas? Hey, hey, halfway between Houston and Corpus on the Texas Gulf Coast. I was going to a little junior college, and I worked at Bus Depot at night. And um, one of my duties was to call the buses on the PA system. And uh, when I had, I wrote a novel about 12 years ago about a bus driver in the 1950s who drove between Houston and Corpus Christi, spent a lot of time in Victoria. And uh, when I went on book tour, you know, if you go on book tour, when you go door to door selling books, as we all have to do, uh, it's good to have a little gig. So on that book tour, I went around doing the bus call to prove that I was authentic, that I knew what I was talking about. And uh, I got into the habit of doing a bus call, and it's a great pleasure uh, to do that because I now do it every time I public, no matter what it is. It can be a high school graduation, a college commencement, a black tie dinner, a white tie dinner. I figure out a way to make uh, the bus call relevant. And Jerry Greenwood gave me the opportunity to make it relevant for you all right now. Be May I have your attention, please? This is your last call for Continental Trailways, 8, 10 p.m., Silver Sides, air condition, through liner to Houston. Now leaving from lane one, for Inez, Edna, Ganado, Louise, El Campo, Pierce, Wharton, Hungerford, Kennethan, Beasley, Rosenberg, Richmond, Sugarland, Stafford, Missouri City, and Houston. All aboard! Don't forget your baggage, please. Now, I realize that some of you are sitting there thinking, what in the hell does that have to do <laughs> with presidential debates? Follow my connection. When I called those buses in 1950, in the 1950s, that was the first time I was paid money to speak into a microphone. <laughs> and it's led me to this long career Blah, 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 blah. The, um, I have, as, uh, as Jonathan said, I've written a lot of novels, written 20 novels, 21 novels. Uh, 22nd is coming out in 2013, as a matter of fact. 
But this nonfiction book called Tension City, which is what we're here to tell, what I'm here to talk about. And by the way, uh, if we have time here, I'll be delighted to take any questions or comments. In fact, there are microphones here, uh, and uh, I'm a big believer in taking questions and comments. So, well, I, I, I'll make sure that there's time left over to do that. But let me give you the guidelines for the questions and comments now, so you won't waste a lot of time uh, uh, coming up with questions. First of all. Rest assured, I am not a pundit. That's guideline number one. Guideline number two, I do not handle criticism well. <laughs> Back to Tension City. This book, I decided to write about my experiences. It was actually 11 presidential, vice presidential debates that I've moderated, uh, beginning with the first one in 1988, it was a, it was a uh, debate between George H.W. Bush and Michael Dukakis in Winston-Salem, uh, North Carolina. Uh, and I, I decided after the 11th, which my last one, which was uh, at Oxford, Mississippi between Barack Obama and John McCain, that I had done my duty to, uh, to uh, uh, God and my country. And uh, I had all the psychic scars that I needed inside after doing 11 of those debates, and I decided I would write about the experience, not only my own experience, but also the experience of the candidates, because I had a really, truly rare and unique experience. I had the privilege, and I do consider it a privilege, of interviewing just about all of the candidates for president or vice president over these last many years about their experiences with debates. It began as an oral history project, and then we decided to use, use those interviews and do a documentary on PBS, and then I followed up some of the other interviews for this, for this book. And so not only is the book about what, how, what it, I experienced on my 11 uh, debates, but also what everybody experienced, the presidents, I mean, I interviewed them all. There were three that I was unable to talk to, uh, Al Gore, for his own reasons, in my opinion, understandable reasons, uh, chose to not talk to me. Uh, he, uh, uh, my own view of it, he was very nice about it. Uh, he just did, he decided that, uh, in my view of this at least, is that there'll come a time to talk about 2000, but for him, think about it. 2000 is an open wound, and uh, he's gonna talk about it when he's good and ready. My guess is he'll talk about it uh, and he'll include the debates in it. And I fully understood why he didn't want to talk about it. Um, Ross Perot is Ross Perot. And uh, Ross Perot didn't want to talk about it. I have a story in the book where I ran into him. I, he'd already said, no, 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 no. I don't want to do any, I don't, wah, wah, forget it. And uh, I had known Ross Perot. Was a news, I, was a news, I started journalism as a newspaper reporter in Texas. And I, got, I knew Perot then. And he and I had a, had a really good uh, relationship as a reporter, uh, news source, and, and all of that. And uh, uh, I had been a Marine, and he, had, you know, he was in the Navy, and, and, and all of that. So we had a lot of things in common. And he and I, uh, he and I had, a, had a good working type relationship. And then I wrote a novel. Uh, I don't know what I was thinking, but I wrote a novel about a presidential debate, of all things. And I crea <laughs> created this Sunday talk show and it was all fiction, okay? But I created this Sunday talk show called Perot. And, and Perot has his, morning, his Sunday morning talk show and all that, and, and Perot read that book and he said, you know, you made fun of me. And uh, he, uh, he really got angry with me and uh, called me on the phone and just ate me a new one. And, uh, uh, and I must say, and this was many years ago, and we have, we have not exchanged uh, had not exchanged words since, and, and I realized that he was right. In other words, I was, it was a dumb thing for me to do. Because every other character in this book, I used uh, for reasons, you know, when you, when you write, a, particularly when you write a novel, you gotta have, you gotta come up with names of characters. And what I always do is find an old phone book from some small town that I like, and just go through them and just pick them out. Uh, but in this particular case, I chose every character in there, with the exception of the talk show host, um, is one of, is a, a, the name of a Dallas Cowboy football player in the 1960s, because I lived in Dallas then, and the Cowboy, no, no, long, long involved story. Anyhow, 
for some reason, I'd use the Perot thing. And Perot was right, I thought. And I ran into him a couple of years ago at a, at a uh, function in Dallas, a fundraising function. And uh, I s said, hey, Ross, uh, he and I had not exchanged words. He was very pleasant and all that. And I said, Ross, you know, I'm doing this book on the, on the presidential debates. And uh, I'd really like to talk to you about it. And he said, well, call me. So he gave me his card. And I called him a couple days later. And he c came on the phone immediately. And uh, I said, you know, I really want to talk to you about that. No, no, I'm not interested in talking. I don't want to talk about it. I said, well, yeah, but uh, some of you, Stockdale said something about it, and you know, and he, I don't want to talk about it. And I said, well, yeah, but then, you know, I just wouldn't leave him alone. He said, Jim, I don't want to talk about it, and I'm not going to talk about it. And uh, so anyhow, uh, I did use the occasion to write him a note, which I should have done years before, and apologize to him for uh, uh, making fun of him in, uh, in the novel. The third person I wasn't able to talk to was Lloyd Benson. Lloyd Benson, by the time I got around doing the interviews, Lloyd Benson was ill. He'd had a stroke and very much wanted to talk, but was, uh, was unable to do so. But at any rate, the only reason I'm telling you all this is that the, ex the experience, the total experience of the presidential debates, is not just, you know, I did this, I did that. It's uh, how these candidates uh, felt about various things. And, uh, and I go through the, what I call major moments. Some of them are, are uh, are, are as small as when George H.W. Bush, you remember when George H.W. Bush looked at his watch and the, that freeway with Perot and, uh, and Bill Clinton? And, um, and <laughs> what, what I loved about it, he, 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 was, he, he just was started looking at his watch, you know, blah, 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 and he, got, he was hit for that by showing he was disconnected and he, didn't, he, was in, he was anxious for the debate to get over and he was bored and everybody jumped on him for it. Well, in my interview with him, I said, what was that all about? And uh, he said, well, you know, it was eight years. He'd, he'd been out of the White House eight years. He said, well, you know, I can just talk straight to you now, Jim. He said, they said I was bored, and I wanted to know when this damn thing was going to be over, and that was absolutely true. <laughs> <laughs> and it was also in that interview I did with him about the debates, I said, well, you know, I asked him some scintillating, you know, brilliant question like, well, what was it like? you know, doing those debates, Mr. President. He said, oh, Jim, he said, those high visibility things, they were tension city. And that's where the title came from. And uh, it I'd been working on this book two and a half, three years. And the title, the working title from day one was Moderator. And that was it. And uh, we, the book was done and, and uh, at the, it was at the publishers and my editor, brilliant man, uh, Bob Loomis uh, at Random House, and he's my, he's my friend, and um, I, he called me and he said, you know, Jim, we've been talking about this, and um, we're, not th we're thinking maybe moderator isn't really the most exciting title <laughs> for this book. And I said, What's a, well, that's what it is. It's moderator. And he said, yeah, but would you buy a book called moderator? <laughs> and I said, Okay, he said, he said, all we ask is give it some thought. See if you can think of something else. And uh, so I remembered what George W. Bush, it was in the book, in fact, but George H. W. Bush, not George W. Bush. George H. W. Bush had said the tension city, and so that's how uh, the title came. But, you know, I was talking about the major moments, and, the, the, you know, there have been, been a lot of major moments. Some of them, as I say, were spoken. They're like, uh, uh, and I asked Reagan about this, where he said, uh, well, Ronald Reagan, Afterward, uh, where he, the great line he used on Mondale, I, I'm not going to use age uh, as an issue. I'm not going to, for political purposes, try to, uh, uh, you know, make the point that uh, my, op my opponent is youthful and inexperienced. And, and you can see on, in the, because uh, we've been running some of these clips on some of these book events, book events I've been doing, you can see Mondale just laughing right there, you know, with, with uh, Reagan when he said that. And I asked Mondale about that, and he said, well, this is afterward, he said, yeah, I was laughing all right. But he said, inside I was crying. He said, I knew right then and there I had lost the election. And I said, what? You knew right then and there? Are you serious? He, yes, I'm serious. I said, so I'm, you know, great reporter that I am. I said, well, did you tell anybody then? He said, <laughs> he said, yes, I left the stage and told my wife, Joan. 
honey, it's over. Because, it, and, and then I realized, and I went back and thought about it and did some more, you know, and I realized that it's probably right. Because there have been two debates. And the first debate, Mondale had won. And, and the reason he won was because Reagan came over as, as age was, he did seem like he wasn't there all the time. He was disconnected and all of that sort of stuff. And uh, so that second debate, uh, and I asked Reagan about that. I said, uh, and he was tired. And I asked Reagan, I said, Reagan, uh, I said, Mr. President, they said you were tired. And, uh, and he said, no, I wasn't tired. He said, I was just overhandled. I was overprepared, you know, because it's very intense. And I'll get to that in a minute. These things are very intense. And they, what he said they had, what the handlers did was they ran through all of this and that. They, what, if, what are you going to say if that? And he said, I just had too much in my head. And uh, I was rattled. And I didn't handle it well. And in that second debate, I said, handlers, leave me alone. I'm going to do what I'm going to do and, uh, and, uh, and go with it. And that's why he did so much. That's why he said he did so much better. And the same, I asked him this question. I said, but you know, Mr. President, that seemed, came over kind of as a prepared line, you know, the thing to Mondale. Oh, no, 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 just came to me. And uh, the, 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 I asked him the same, you know, that line he used on Carter, you know, there you go again. And uh, in fact, um, of all these candidates that I interviewed, uh, I asked when it was relevant, I asked him, well, that great line you got off, was that, did you think about that ahead of time? And only one of all the candidates I interviewed admitted that he or she had some prepared lines. All of them, oh, no, no, it just came to me, it's all spontaneous. The one exception was Bill Clinton. And Bill Clinton talked to me about these debates. I mean, he was like talking shop to him. I mean, this was, this, he loved all that stuff. And he said, oh, yeah, he said, man, we had all kinds of, 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 of one-liners ready to go if they were, you know, if they were appropriate. and. And sometimes I could use them, sometimes I couldn't. But he was the only one who would admit uh, that he uh, that, that they used uh, those things. The uh, one of the most uh, people are asking me all the time is our uh, what what has been the impact of these debates? How important are they? And where there are some specific cases. Some of them I've mentioned. Uh, a, a, another, probably the most dramatic, where you could say, or the two most dramatic, which you could argue probably without any uh, uh, opposition that they affected not only the outcome of the debate but could have uh, and probably affected the outcome of the election. One of them was Gerald Ford, Jimmy Carter, when Gerald Ford said that uh, Eastern Europe was not under the domination of the Soviet Union. And uh, that was when they still had the, the uh, uh, format of a, a, a moderator and some journalist panelists and Max Frankel of the New York Times, who was one of the panelists, said, excuse me, excuse me, Mr. President, did you just say that Eastern Europe is not dominated by the Soviet Union when there are tanks and armies, you know, whatever? And he, he, didn't, he didn't pick up on it, and he, he repeated it again. And uh, uh, here again, uh, Ford told, I said, Mr. President, do you, you realize what you had done at that moment? He said, really, no. He said, I was, I was thinking, Oh sure, they had they had you know the Soviet army was everywhere and there were Soviet tanks everywhere, but I was thinking about their spirit, the spirit of Eastern Europe. The Eastern Europeans didn't see themselves as being dominated by the Soviet Union, and he said if I had just added three or four sentences here and there, it would have been fine. But I didn't, and it was a, it was a terrible mistake, and and uh, it it hurt uh, it hurt. Uh, 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 Ford uh, terribly in the election, and m some people believe uh, it cost him the election. I asked Ford that specifically. Do you think it cost you the cost you the election? He said, "Look, there's so many reasons why people vote or don't vote. You can't. It's hard to isolate one thing." Uh, Jimmy Carter said the same thing that he he wasn't sure uh, that that was the final thing, but it's certainly part of it. The other example where you could make the case that it had a, had a, uh, a, a, a definite impact on the outcome was the famous uh, Kitty Dukakis question to, uh, to Michael Dukakis in the George, against uh, George H.W. Bush. The question was asked by Bernie Shaw. They, they called it the killer question, and I have a whole story, backstory about that, which I will not repeat here. It's too long. but. Uh, I'm sure each and every one of you will read that book. If not to yourself, you'll probably read it out loud. 
There's an audio book you can even get if you don't want to read it. <laughs> but at any rate, Bernie Shaw asked Michael Dukakis, for those of you all who uh, were too young to remember, um, uh, 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 Bernie, who was the moderator, asked uh, Michael Dukakis, if Kitty Dukakis were raped and murdered, would you be in favor of uh, the death penalty for the, uh, for the killer? And Dukakis said, no, I wouldn't, Bernard. And then he, he went on a small, low-key treatise on his views on uh, capital punishment. And it was read as, uh, it, I mean, in fact, George H.W. Bush himself said, my God, if somebody had asked me a question like that, I would say, yeah, I'd grab the gun, kill him with my own hand. In other words, it, he took it, he, uh, uh, Dukakis took it as an issue question, and everybody else said, hey, you should have taken it as an emotional question, and Dukakis didn't. And, and here again, I talked to Dukakis afterwards, and he said, you know, sure, you know, it, it was seen as a mistake. But uh, I had, he, 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 his explanation was, I've been governor of Massachusetts, I've been in public life for years, I've been talking about capital punishment for years. To me, I just saw that as another capital punishment question. And I just didn't pick up on it. And that was a, that was a mistake, in that he didn't, you know, do, di, di, didn't react emotionally. And in that case, um, the, uh, the back story there, which I'm not going to tell you, ha, 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 uh, <laughs> has to do with the three panelists who were working with Bernie, who, and they're trying to get him not to ask that question. And I'll just leave it right there. But the, the, uh, the, 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 the end result for uh, uh, Dukakis also, uh, Kitty Dukakis, said the day of the debate, the night after the debate, that was an unfair cheap shot question. A few years later, she changed her mind and said on re in retrospect that was a fair question. I asked Dukakis himself if he thought it was a fair question, and he said yes, he thought it was a fair question. And, uh, and, and as a lot of people would, I would, would agree with me on that, is that it really wasn't about the question, it was the answer. The answer is what if, if for instance, Shaw had asked the exact same question, and, had, and if Dukakis, for whatever reason, had taken the emotional part to it, I mean, they probably wouldn't even be talking about it. Uh, it's just, that's just the way, uh, just the way things are. There's, there's another, another one that, uh, that has to do not like, a little bit like looking at the watch, that are what more body language than spoken language things that happen in a debate. And my experience has been, and I make a point of this in the book, uh, and it goes back to the first one. The first presidential debate, remember, the first televised presidential debate was between John F. Kennedy and Richard Nixon. And I lay all this out in the book. Uh, Nixon had been ill. He'd gotten right out, come right out of a hospital for that debate. And he looked, he looked sick. He had been sick, and he looked sick. And uh, Howard K. Smith, who was the moderator, said, well, Mr. Vice President, uh, we've got a makeup person here. You want to be, you, wanna, you know, we can make you up. Said, no makeup, no makeup. And, uh, uh, but he did have somebody on his staff put a little powder on him. Well, that made him look even worse. And so you had, on the, on, on the TV that night, you had, and Kennedy came in, Kennedy was, was uh, had uh, Addison's disease, and, and one of the treatments made his skin look tanner than it normally did. And, uh, uh, and, and because uh, uh, Nixon had, had a little bit of fever, he started sweating. Anyhow, the contrast of the, the, the cool warrior, uh, Kennedy versus the haggard, you know, sick, sickly, uh, nervous because of the sweat, uh, Nixon stood out, and it was proved beyond a, a doubt because in the polls afterward, it showed that the people who listened to that on the radio thought Nixon won that debate hand down, hands down. People who watched it on television thought Kennedy won it hands down. Remember, this was early days of television, too, 19, a lot of, there were only about, I don't know, 45% of the American people watched it on television because they didn't have the rest of the people didn't have uh, television sets anyhow it's an interesting thing but anyhow Nixon said in his memoir when he was when he was writing about this he said quote clearly I spent too much time worrying about what I was going to say and not enough time worrying about what I looked like and I say in that book and I there are a lot of examples of this that uh, any candidate who, who makes that same mistake as may have 
may suffer the same result because, and you can argue, a lot of people would, oh, well, that means it's show business. It's all about appearances, and, and it isn't about substance, and as a consequence, you know, that's, that's a bad thing. I disagree 100%. I think that, that the, what, what people get from a presidential debate, a televised presidential debate, is not just substance and differences over various positions and all of that. Keeping in mind that these debates come in late September, early October, 90% or more of the people have either made up their minds or already leaning pretty strongly one way or another uh, on, the, on the issues, whether you're, whether you're for this or for that and uh, this is my person and uh, whatever. What they all come for, everybody, is to see the people on the same stage at the same time and they want to take the measure of the person. They, and you want to say, can I imagine this, can I imagine him or her sitting behind the desk in the Oval Office? How is, how is this person likely to handle issues of sending Americans into harm's way? How is this person likely to handle another 9-11 situation, if one should come, or another Katrina situation? What is, what is, what, do I like this person? I mean, what the likability thing, all of that kind of stuff. And um, it is, uh, you, you can argue that, uh, that that shouldn't matter, but it does. And the ability, a president of the United States, no matter what he or she believes, no matter what he or she is politically, uh, if he or she cannot explain him or herself to the American people on television, it isn't going to work. It's a device through which people, uh, that's how they communicate to the American people. So it's a valid, it seems to me, a very valid, uh, for instance, you know Thomas Jefferson, you've heard of Thomas Jefferson. In fact, this street right over there is named after him, among other things. You know how he talked? How like that? <laughs> he had a very high pitched voice. How, the, how, how well do you think he would do in a presidential debate? <laughs> Those are the breaks, the breaks of time. Uh, uh, I, would, uh, uh, I, uh, I would say one other thing about the presidential debates, and it will open this to, uh, to, uh, to questions, um, that there are a lot of folks who want to th about, worry about, are they really debates? What about the four men? Uh, there are folks who, 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 and I'm sure maybe even some of you all, I hope not, but there could be somebody here who would say, well, you, Larry, you don't follow up hard enough. You let people get away with murder. They're giving their talking points, and you don't blah, 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 blah. And I know there are people, I know from my NewsHour experience, that there are people have been watching the NewsHour for 36 years, and they're gathered, they get, gathered every evening waiting for Robert McNeil or me or one of us, you say, Senator, you know, you ask a question and then you get the answer and one of us yells, liar! <laughs> Ain't gonna ever happen. <laughs> I take the position that the people who, whether it's a presidential debate or it's in a television interview, the people who are watching that and listening are just as smart as I am. And if I ask, as hap happens all the time, and you all know it, and I know it, and we all know it, you ask some public person a question, and the person doesn't answer it. And you're sitting there thinking, Billy Bob is not answering that question. All right, so the, the interviewer, the moderator, can come back and ask the question again. And then if he or she still doesn't answer it, then what do you do? You don't yell, you're not answering the question. <laughs> but you get the, you gotta get it over. You gotta get the message over. And my feeling is, and I've done it wrong, many, I've called it wrong many times. You can go, you can stay with it too, you can ask it three or four times, or you can stay with it too long, or you can go too early. And, uh, it, but it's all a matter of judgment and you have to make a decision just like that. And, uh, uh, but I, I uh, if somebody says to me, well, you didn't follow up on, uh, on, on what? And he clearly didn't answer the question. I said, oh, is that right? Did you notice that too? <laughs> That's what it's all about. And uh, 
The other thing that, uh, that, uh, uh, that I feel very strongly about, and, and that it, it is, it is uh, fortunately now part, of, it's now a given, these presidential debates are now a critical part of the electoral process. These are not television programs. This isn't show business. This is as important step in the election of a president or vice president uh, as vo registering to vote and vote and going to rallies and, and, and conventions and all the other things. They are, it's the only time during the course of a campaign when the candidates can be seen side by side on the same stage talking about the same things and you can measure all kinds of things, not only content, but you can also, uh, as I say, measure the person and those things, all of those things matter. Now, questions, comments? Sir. Just turn on the mic, please. You said you don't take criticisms well, so I'll say this. You, Charlie Rose, and uh, Ted Koppel, I've seen as the, the triumvirate of quality journalism after Edward R. Morrow. Thank you. Thank you. Now, that's, that, see, that's my definition of criticism. <laughs> I've thought for about two decades that the, the most powerful people in the country are their citizens and their, their lack of involvement drives a lot of the, the process and, you know, and, and, and uh, their, their not being as involved as they should be uh, leads to a lot of the incidents that you, you know, the presidential watch, et cetera. How, how, why, how, how can they get more, realize more of their power to do more than just vote, and uh, you know, uh, decide on a on a fuller uh, and being more more involved than than they are today. Well, everybody has to do the, do it their way, and I couldn't agree with you more. Uh, the uh, it's the uh, I would I'd give you my simple my simplistic answer to this, which to me is an extremely important answer. Yeah. Here again, quoting Thomas Jefferson. Jefferson said, he told his fellow, I started to say fellow and sister founders, there were no sister founders as we know, there were only founding fathers. He told them all, quite openly, when it was all said and done, he said, look, we're this isn't gonna work. This democratic society we have created is not going to work if we do not have an informed electorate. But then there's no device, there's no device in the Constitution or in the Declaration of Independence or anywhere else for the, for the informing except the First Amendment. So it's a huge responsibility to do the, that, that, that it's a two-way responsibility. The people in the press, all elements of the press, and then the new press now that, that involves, uh, you know, wee-wees and tweets and wah-wahs and, you know, all these kinds of other little dope things, I started to say dopey thing. I don't mean, I didn't say that, I didn't say it, I came close. Uh, most of which I now do understand at my advanced age, because I have to, I have to keep up. But anyhow, that's, that, uh, th that's a responsibility, but the real responsibility is for every individual. If, 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 if you see something in a presidential debate, or if you see something in one of these primary debates, or you read something in a newspaper, or you read it in a blog, or you get it on a tweet, and you don't get it, there's plenty of ways now to find out everything. One of the great things about what has happened in this information revolution that we're still in the middle of, we, this information revolution isn't over by a, not even close to being over. We have no idea if, it, if in fact, it may never be over because there there's new things all the time. So that means everything is available, but it's not as accessible to everybody. I mean, you gotta, you gotta know how to do, do one of these little dodo things. You know, and you gotta and you gotta know that 70 million books have now just been downloaded by Google, and you gotta know how to use. You gotta have you know you, and all that kind of stuff. People have to work. The citizens have to work harder now than they ever have had to work to get information because there because there's been such a proliferation of of quote information and opinion about information that it's coming at you all the time. It's like a storm, and you gotta sort through it. Uh, and, and, the only, and the only people who can do it is the individual. 
and it's not easy, and it takes time, but with the new technology, it can be sped up, and uh, it's a critical responsibility. I agree with you. Yes, sir. Uh, first of all, thank you for the gift of the PBS NewsHour. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. As, as you have uh, looked at all these presidential uh, candidates through the mirror of uh, moderating their debates over, over the past uh, number of years, which of these presidential candidates do you believe was the best master of the presidential debate in order to uh, promote his candidacy? Did you all hear the question? Yeah, yeah. that's too bad. I'm going to dodge that question because not for any reason other than the fact that my perspective on these candidates from, from, from the middle seat, so to speak, is so narrow. I, I, my, my, I'm concentrated on getting my job done, getting it done, and it's only afterward, I never sit there and say, oh boy, that, he really landed one could either be a bomb or it could be a, a, a sock. I don't think of it in those terms. Wow, this guy's really wiping the floor with this guy. I don't, I just don't, I don't think of that way. In terms of articulate, I'll tell you one thing in general, and then I'll be a little more specific. My experience, based on not only the debates, but also just what I've been doing in the news hour, of interviewing people at near the top in American politics, at the top in American politics, I have come across almost zero accidents at the very top. There are some accidents down below in the chain, but you don't find anybody getting the nomination for President of the United States or Vice President of the United States who are zeros in another context. And so they're all fairly articulate. They're all know, they all know how to, how to handle themselves under pressure. They know how to articulate uh, they know how to explain themselves, et cetera. Some of them have personality problems. Some of them don't. Some of them have personality problems that, are, that people like. Some people have personality problems that people can't stand. And it's hard to say, well, Billy Bob is the single best debate, uh, debate participant I have ever, ever, ever uh, been involved in. Yes, there are some who are a little more glib, but glibness is not always seen as an asset by everybody. Uh, remember, and uh, to use one example, and you can, and this is, clean, this is as clean as I can put it, okay? And I mean this is cl as clean. The, uh, and I haven't used, mentioned this example before, the first 2000 debate between George W. Bush and Al Gore. It was in Boston. I'm, I moderated all those debates that, that year but that first one in Boston, that's the one where there was a split screen when George W. Bush was talking, Al Gore was <laughs> doing a lot of that. Didn't go over well with the audience, with the voters. They didn't like, they didn't like, he thought it was, they thought he was disrespectful, some people did. Some people thought he was, he was just kind of, just dumb, you know, and, uh, and it, he would, it, it was not likable. Now here's George W. Bush, where some folks didn't agree with him on some things. They may have agreed more with Gore on, on some of those issues, but they liked George W. Bush. So, and, and remember, remember, it isn't about what the moderator sees now. When I'm moderating, I'm about from here to the you and to you, okay? So I'm the closest person in the room to the, to the, to the, to the candidates. And I didn't even know about the sign and the whatever because I have a rule. I'm talking to, I asked Bush a question, I always look at the person who's talking. I never look because I don't want to have eye contact and be involved in any way influencing the uh, reaction. So when that debate was over, I w we're walking out of the halls and my family was with me. One of my daughters was walking with me and she said, uh, hey dad, that was something that Gore did. And I stopped and I said, what the hell did Gore do? <laughs> and she said, well, all that sign and everything. She said, that's gonna be the story. I, I didn't know what the hell she was talking about. And here I was the closest person. And so that's why I'm saying that, that it's all in the eye of the beholder and among many other things. And I think, I, I thought I dodged that fairly articulately, <laughs> fairly skillfully. Yes, ma'am. 
Again, I want to thank you for being here today. Your speech is wonderful. And yeah. I just have a very specific question. Sure. How soon after the debates were you allowed access to interview the candidates? And how easily were you given access to the candidates to interview for this book? Question, I yes. know that yeah. it's a broad group sure. of candidates, but how soon after the debates did it you get? The time varied just because of our own timing, but without the, with those three exceptions that I mentioned, every one of them was eager to talk about it. Oh, great. You know, because this was a big, this was a big, quite important experience for them. Even the people that had negative experiences, they wanted to talk about it, they wanted to explain themselves. And these were all, it would be like, it'd be like, uh, and I've used this analogy before, it, it would be like a sports writer, you know, talking to some old ball players, you know, about their great moments or about uh, the time they, 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 they overthrew first base and uh, they lost the World Series, you know, whatever. In other words, it's, 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 it's World Series kind of talk. And in every one of those cases, it was well after the events. So they had time. They didn't. They 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 were they were very straight with me. It seemed to me, and and I had no no access problem. They were all very eager. I told you about Bill Clinton. All of them were that way. Bill Clinton was just a little more effusive than the others. And were you thinking of writing a book when you were interviewing? Them? No, no, I was not. I, we, it started as an oral history. In fact, the debate commission said, "Why don't we Why don't we start an oral history on this and talk to these folks? Would you do it, Jim?" I said, "Sure, I'd love to do it." And uh, and then one of our folks at the news hour said, "Hey, that's great stuff. Why don't we Why don't we uh, uh, think about doing a documentary?" And then, in order to do, we didn't have everybody, so then we went back and started. Went, went, took our, then I went back through and interviewed everybody that I we could, that who who we could find, and I did it over a period of 20 years. The interviews happened over a period of 20 years, and one of the reasons that uh, I decided to write this book was, it was as, it less my experiences than it was the experience of these other. It was just a unique thing to have all in one place. And so, uh, and it was, it was wonderful for me. It was great, great fun. Because um, these were not, you know, these were not, these were not hard boiled, you know, uh, let me, what, what did you steal from whatever type uh, interviews? These were all, just tell me about it. Tell me your story. What happened? You know, la, la, la. So it was great fun. Well, and it's great history. Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. Thank you. Yes, sir. I have a question about the uh, audiences at the current Republican debates. Yeah. Uh, I'm trying to think of how to put this politely. I guess the vitriol we're seeing coming from the audience. Is that more of a result of handpick audiences by the sponsors of the debate or the general political climate or a combination? For, the, for those of you who didn't hear, the question is, Am I enjoying this experience at the National Book Festival as much as I had the others? <laughs> Look, the, the the straight answer is, if you're gonna if you're gonna have an audience, let's say the, let's say all right, the only people who can come to this event at this in this tent this morning at ten o'clock are people. Who have uh, I forget that I won't I won't even I won't go with I won't go with that. It, it, if if it, it, in this these three Republican debates, remember there were 40 of them in 2008 because you didn't have an incumbent in either the Democratic or Republican uh, Party, so there were 40 of these n nominating uh, debates. In this case, there have been three so far, but each one of them were they were sponsored by organizations and they had their members there. And they were political. This, these were not, quote, town halls in any sense of the term. There was no, like, the town hall meetings they have for the national debates, where they, the Gallup organization selects cross sections and all of that. These were folks who, who were uh, Wawa members. And so uh, they were, uh, it wasn't that they were, they, they weren't handpicked as individuals, but they were handpicked as a group. And uh, so that probably explains that. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Hi, I was intrigued by the uh, story of your beginnings in the uh, junior college and oh, yeah. uh, working for Continental Trailways and so on. And uh, myself, having had a fairly circuitous and serendipitous career, I wondered if you ever dreamed back then or where in your career did you start to realize you were actually going to be somebody who was moderating presidential debates, not to mention the thousands of interviews of famous people all over the world that you've conducted. Uh, it, it just seems to me like a, a dream come true, a storybook kind Absolutely. of career. And I wondered uh, where along the way did you kind of come to the realization that, wow, I can't believe I'm doing this. 
Oh my, that, uh, everything you said is absolutely correct. It, it began when I was 16 years old in a place called Beaumont, Texas. Anybody know Beaumont? Yeah. Hey. I was in high school, sophomore in high school. I had already made my career plan. I knew what I was gonna do when I grew up. I was gonna play shortstop for the Brooklyn Dodgers. <laughs> there was a fellow, there's some of you folks that will know who, who, who he was. There was a fellow named Pee Wee Reese who had the job <laughs> at the time. But Pee Wee, so Pee Wee wasn't in on my plan. But the coach of our high school baseball team said, uh, he got, the word got out that I was gonna, I wanted to be a pro ball player. And he, he said, Jimmy, uh, let me give you a little advice. Uh, you may want to come up with a backup plan <laughs> because uh, you're never going to make it as a professional ball player. You can't, you can't hit well enough. You can't even catch a really high fly ball. I mean, come up with something else. Oh, the, oh that criticism went down really poorly. <laughs> but I took it. But then, but I saw it. Here's what happened. I, two things happened. School, any school teachers here? Okay, you'll love this story. And this story you've either, you, you either participated in as a parent or a student yourself. I mean, a parent, a student, or a teacher yourself. But anyhow, two things happened. After the baseball thing, I decided, because we had sports writers for the papers who came to our games, and I liked those guys. I thought, hey, wait a minute. I'll be a sports writer, and I'll, I'll go to all kinds of games, and I can write them up. That'll be great fun. And at almost exactly the same time, I had written a paper for sophomore English, and they called them themes then. And I remember what it was about. It was about Charles Dickens' Tale of Two Cities. The teacher, richly deserved, deservedly so, gave me an A on the paper. <laughs> but more importantly, wrote up in the left-hand corner, Jimmy, you're a very good writer. I went home, told my mother, Mom, I'm going to be a writer. And she said, that's great, son. So I went back to school that very next day, found the faculty advisor to the student newspaper, and essentially said, here I am. <laughs> and with the exception of the three years that I was in the Marine Corps on active duty, I have been doing writing journalism or writing fiction or one or the other and all the above from then on. And it was then when I started going to, when I became editor of my high school, then we moved to San Antonio, and I became editor of the high school newspaper. Then that little junior college where I was working. I, I, when I was working in the, I was working eight hours a day with the bus depot, but I also was editor of the paper. And, but, but because, and you know how I got to be editor of the paper? Here again, I found, when I signed up to this little junior college, it only cost $40 to go to school there for the whole year. And I couldn't afford to go to the University of Texas, and I needed, so I was working to save money so I could go to, a, at any rate, I asked the, the person I signed up for, I said, well, where, I, I'm more interested in working on a newspaper, where is the, uh, who, where can I find a faculty, so I told me the faculty advisor, I go to this guy who's an economics teacher, who's, and, I, and I go to him, I say, I'm, uh, I've just signed on here, I'm a, I'm a freshman, and I'd like to work on the newspaper, and the guy stands up, sticks his hand out, and says, congratulations, you're the editor. <laughs> And I literally wrote every story in that newspaper. I edited, I laid out the page, I took the whole stuff down to the, uh, the daily newspaper, they printed and I brought it back. It was only 300 students in our school. And I brought the paper back and handed them out, all to 300, 300 students. But anyhow, from then on, then I, got, I really got into a Hemingway mode. And, uh, and, and Hemingway said, you want to be a writer? Because then by then I was, you know, I was going to be more than just a newspaper person. Uh, and, uh, and Hemingway said, you want to be a writer? You get a job on a newspaper. It'll keep bread on the table. It will force you to deal with the English language in some semi-coherent way on a regular basis. And most importantly, if you pay attention, you'll, have, you'll meet all kinds of people and have all kinds of experiences that you can later use in your fiction, you know, whether you're writing short stories or novels or whatever. I 
that, though, during that period, and then I went to the University of Missouri, I saved the money working at a bus depot, went away to the University of Missouri Journalism School, the great journalism school, never set foot on a place before, <laughs> went there solely because of that. By then I was taking English course, and I was determined I was going to be a fiction writer, and I was going to be a big time national newspaper man. Big time, that was, journalist wasn't even a word then, it was sounded like a venereal disease, it was a, <laughs> it, you were a newspaper woman or a newspaper man, that's what it was. And uh, at any rate, that's when the dream came. And uh, I mean, I saw, the, I saw it all. And, and I, I'm, I stand here, you got it absolutely right. I'm standing here, well, let's see, <laughs> be lit of 60 years later uh, from that time in Beaumont, doing and being exactly what I wanted to do. And I mean, I've written all these books, and I'm standing here as a, as a Wawa journalist, moderating presidential debates, all that sort of stuff. I mean, I am very lucky. And let me tell you one more thing about that. There is nothing worse and more annoying, at least to me, to be around somebody who's fortunate and either doesn't know it or won't admit it. You are not with one of those right now. <laughs> I think we are. Hey, I only have two words for you all. Thank you. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.